This is Ivan Kulov, the Russian bear. Yes, I've wrestled many times. I had the pleasure defeating Bruno San Martino, WWF champion. But I want to encourage everybody to listen to In Your Head, online.com, the best in the West and the East. All right, and welcome to In Your Head Wrestling Radio. I am the internet icon, handsome Jackie Jones, and I'm joined by Tom Hankins. How are you doing tonight? Real good. How are you doing, Jack? Excellent, thank you. I want to uh, thank you for coming on tonight. Uh, we're going to talk about your career and, of course, your new book. All right. Yeah. Uh, the Mat, the Mob, and Music, which is available by Crowbar Press, who uh, put out a lot of quality uh, books throughout the years. And um, when did you when did you uh, start to write the book? Or when were you interested in putting out a book? Uh well, actually, I was just writing little bits on Facebook, and Scott Teal got a hold of me and said, "Why well, are you giving away your life story?" He said, "I'll publish it for you." Uh-huh. So I took—I had maybe three or four chapters up there. I took it off, took them off, and told him, "Okay, I'll finish the book." And I guess it probably took me about five years altogether. It took both of us after I wrote it and he edited it and cleaned it up a little, and uh, so it was about five years in the making. Mm-hmm. And uh, what what is uh, what's the response been like so far by uh, the people who have got a chance to read it? Uh, so far, everybody writing me telling me they love it, and uh, I'm really surprised I've gotten so much response from it. Mm-hmm. So what? I'm glad to hear that. Why is that. I didn't know how much interest there'd be in in me. Mm-hmm. I was asked why do you th- why is that why is that surprising to you? Well, there's never a big name in the business, and. Uh, Although I work main events a lot of places, but uh, under different names. So uh, I was just surprised that anybody might be interested in reading the whole story. Mm-hmm. So I decided to put together everything, my music career, my wrestling career, and working with organized crime, sometimes all three at the same time. <laughs> and uh, I was happy with what, what it came out, what Scott did with it, and... Uh, I'm pretty happy with it. Uh, when you said that about kind of all three at the same time, how how similar is the wrestling business to organized crime? Or is there a lot of organized crime that run wrestling business? I don't know. Well, no. They had, not that I know of, they had nothing to do with it. In fact, the guy I personally worked for, he, when I told him I had to go wrestle, he thought I was going to, I told him I was going to St. Louis to wrestle Jack Briscoe. And I, when I got back, he said, did you win? I said, well, no, he's the world champion. I didn't win. He said, I wasn't supposed to. And he goes, oh, oh he didn't understand how wrestling worked at all. And I explained it to him. And uh, But he still didn't really get it, you know, catch it. Uh-huh. But he had a giant TV at his house. And I'd go over there and, with a giant uh, antenna on his roof. And I could pick up Calgary wrestling. I could pick up East Coast wrestling. This is from Iowa. And... Uh, but he never really watched it. But he hired me because I was a wrestler, and I was uh, just finished up in Kentucky for Saul Weingroff in '73, and I was going to go down to Mississippi for the Calkins. And I decided not to go to Mississippi. He offered me a job that paid me like ten times more money than what I was, that I was getting wrestling to manage his warehouse. And pretty soon, I became his uh, right hand man. Until we had a ugly parting of the ways, but nope. I expected that. No, I don't want to give away everything in your book, but what what is uh, being the right hand man, uh, right hand man of a uh, of uh, a mob guy? What does that entail? Oh, traveling with him everywhere. He'd pick fights, and I'd have to fight him. Me and another guy. He'd pick fights with people, but it was mostly just traveling around collecting money from. He had a bunch of adult bookstores. And from all the way from Indiana to Utah, and we travel, collect money, and do business. Go visit these old mafia guys in the hospital. I guess I became a mafia goodwill ambassador. Didn't even know it. Uh, when you mean when you say collect money, was it like uh, just? Was well, out of like money? the movie arcades and oh, all yeah. the magazines and novelties and stuff they sold. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it wasn't like you were like Rocky, before he you know when he was breaking thumbs and everything. No. All right, all right. 
this was just uh actually everything came out of Cleveland and we just distributed it mm-hmm. in our chain of stores. Nope. We had seven seven stores. Mm-hmm. You said you had a a violent breakup or uh, what happened there? Oh, I got mad at him. We got in a big screaming match, and I took all the keys to all these stores and warehouses. I had them all in the key ring and threw them at him, and somehow my aim was good, and I hit him right between the eyes. <laughs> his name was Fat Eddie, and uh, his bodyguard, this big black guy named Bush, but he was also my best friend, and Eddie looked at Butch, and Butch just shook his head, no, he wasn't going to do anything, and Butch told me later he thought it was funny. I just got mad. I knew the FBI was watching him, and I knew it couldn't end good there, so I thought it was a good time to get out. Mm-hmm. I saw uh, in the book, uh, you actually mentioned uh, uh, looking through uh, photos uh, with the FBI. Now, uh, what was the story there? You Did you uh, did, did you turn, like, state evidence? Or? Well, they wanted me to, but uh, I really didn't have anything to tell them. They sh- were showing me pictures, and they were mostly pictures of me, and I just ignored them. There were pictures of me, like, all over the country. They were following me. Mm-hmm. I had a feeling they were, and I had a feeling they were watching uh, the warehouse where we were. We'd go out in the loading dock and sit there and roll joints. And I, there's a big empty factory building about a half block away. I said, you know, I bet the FBI is up there watching us. So I'd flip them the bird every now and then. And sure enough, they were up there, and I'd look at these pictures. There's a picture of me flipping them off. And I said, oh, yeah, I recognize this guy. And I handed him my picture, flipping him off. And uh, they were just trying to lock up Big Eddie. They finally got him for taxes. Mm. It's like a lot of like, like a lot of the people. Uh, what, yeah. Now, before we get back to wrestling, uh, what would you say some of the – what movies um, – I don't know how involved you were, so maybe you can't really answer this, but what movies, in your opinion uh, – uh, capture uh, the mob lifestyle the best, like the most accurately? Well, you know, I watched the old movie Night in the City with uh, Stanislaus Zipsko and uh, Mike Mazurki in it the other night. I really like that. I won't, the wrestler didn't throw me that much. I thought it was a decent movie, but I wasn't as crazy about as a lot of people was i remember the original wrestler Vern Gagne made which is really a crummy movie but it has some great wrestlers in it and i still watch that once in a while yeah yeah body slam but yeah now what what drew you to, to what drew you to uh become a wrestling fan what was it about wrestling that uh that really well got you? i was 10 years old 1958 and uh we just got in the tv and I'd never even heard of professional wrestling. We were changing channels, and we changed, and there was Hans Schmidt wrestling Farmer Don Marlin from Chicago. And right away, I was hooked, right? It's like that. I said, stop. And I had to watch the whole show, and I became an immediate wrestling fan. My father felt compelled to tell me that, well, it's all fake. It's all fake. I said, well, you know, I don't care if it's fake. I said, I like it. Yeah. So I always never really believed it, but I always... Loved watching it and participating in it. Mm-hmm. So I started a fan club, pro wrestling fan club in 63, I think, with Norman Keitzer. He was vice president. And Burt Ray, I don't know if anybody remembers him, but he was a great writer and humorist in wrestling. And uh, just kind of went from there, and I became friends with the local promoter, Art Mitchell, in Cedar Rapids, and he introduced me to Gus Karras from Kansas City, which everybody should know who he is. And uh, I was what, 10, 11, 12 years old, I guess. And I told him I wanted to be a wrestler, and I'd go down to the box office every wrestling show they had and spend all day down there talking, wrestling with them. Mm-hmm. And uh, finally, I got a band going, and we ended up doing pretty good in the Midwest. I had a couple of hits in the Midwest. And we moved out to Los Angeles, and I kind of quit following wrestling because I was so busy with the music out here. But then, uh, I don't know. I got went back to, to Cedar Rapids for a while, and 
I saw there was going to be wrestling. So I went down to the wrestling show. It was one of Dick Murdoch's very first matches. I was sitting there alone in the ringside seat, sitting in the back, just watching. And uh, Dick came and sat down next to me and started talking to me out of the blue. So I talked to him. He got me interested again. So I started attending the matches. And then in uh, August 1969, about a year later, I was in Chicago, went to see the Grateful Dead. And uh, I dropped some acid. I dropped a double hit of orange sunshine acid to see them. Well, that was like one hit too many. And I was hallucinating even the next day. But then I saw his wrestling at the International Amphitheater, the Chain Gang against Dick the Bruiser and the Crusher. I'd read about the Chain Gang. I knew it was Don Fargo. I didn't know who his partner was at the time. I said, told my wife, I said, we're going to go see that. She goes, oh, no, because she wasn't a wrestling fan. But we went and got like fourth row seats somehow. And I was still tripping on asses, but... When I saw the chain gang come down the aisle, which was Don Fargo and Kenny Mack, came down the aisle, surrounded by Hell's Angels and their colors. I don't know. I just uh, I decided I'm going to actually be a wrestler. Mm -hmm. I told that to my wife, and she laughed at me, and told my friends, and they laughed at me. I got back home, told the band that I was quitting, them them to train to wrestle, and it turned out the guitar player was a wrestling fan too, Dan Daniels was a wrestling fan. He'd lived in Hawaii next door to Ed Francis for years. He knew the Francis kids. So he said, well, I want to, yeah, I want to wrestle too. I said, well, you only weigh 120. But he had a brother-in-law who weighed about 320. He was going to be my partner. We were going to be a tag team. And we decided to go with the bro brother-in-law's middle name, Reed, R-E-I-D. So we went with that, and we trained in my backyard, basically. But it wasn't like backyard wrestling. That we trained in my backyard on mats for, well, you know, just three years. Uh, and then we go down to the uh, auditorium, Veterans Auditorium in Cedar Rapids, when they had matches there, and we'd get in the ring and be set up in the afternoon, and we'd work out. And uh, one day, the local promoter there was Larry Lewis, and he went down the dressing room, brought all the wrestlers up, and uh, Gus Karras was with them. And he said, okay, boys, let's see what you got. So there's Pat O'Connor sitting there, Roger Kirby, Omar Atlas, and, like, you know, the whole roster sitting there watching us. And I thought, uh oh I said, well, this is my chance right now. So Dan and I got in and worked on a match we'd been working on for a couple of years. And Gus stopped us after about five minutes and said, okay, that's enough. And I thought, uh-oh. said, so we screwed it up. Something went wrong. Uh -huh. He said, no, you guys are ready. He said, call Nick Goulas. Tell him you've been working for me. Tell him to call me, and I'll back up your story, whatever you tell him. So that's what I did, and I talked Goulas into hiring me, hiring us. And he brought us down there in 1973. And Johnson City, Tennessee was our first match against Dandy Jack Donovan and uh, Tom Shaft. Turned out to be Tom Shaft's first match, too, and he didn't tell Goulas either. <laughs> so there's Jack Donovan in the ring with three guys that never worked before. <laughs> and he, But he talked talks us through the match. Uh -huh. But as soon as I get, we got back to Nashville, Goulas called me in his office. And said, well, what the hell was that last night? He said, you guys were great. I said, what? He said, you guys were great. I said, well, thank you. He said, the greatest stinkers I ever saw. I said, he didn't even tie up right. And he was, I think he was really mad because we got all the heat. We took everybody's heat. We didn't know enough. We were in the opening match. We took everybody's heat. We got so much heat from the crowd and uh, pissed everybody off. Pissed the rest of the wrestlers off. Uh -huh. And he was right in the midst of firing us when Donovan walked in, the, in his office in the Sam Davis Hotel and talked him out of it, talked him into keeping us. And we were around a few more weeks, and uh, for actually a couple more months. And uh, I was on TV. We were on TV in Memphis wrestling Jackie Fargo and uh, Jerry Jarrett. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was supposed to be... Split falls. They took the first fall. We were going to take the second fall. And uh, Fargo had 
on to pin me, and I went to push him off, but he grabbed my trunks and held on without telling me he was changing the finish and pinned me. So we lost two straight falls, which was, I didn't care, but he didn't tell me. And I said, ah, fuck you, Fargo. And I didn't realize the camera was right on my face. And the whole, it was live TV. And as soon as I got back to Nashville, Google called me in his office and said, what the hell was you doing down there? Yeah, tell me if I ever put wrestling on on there again, they'll cancel wrestling. You know how long I've been on that station? I said, oh, no, Nick, how long? You see, I started laughing. He said, you think I'm funny? I said, I think you're hilarious, Nick. He said, well, you're fired. I said, good. Because I already talked to Saul Weingroff about going to work for him. He was running competition. So Goulas fired us, and Saul hired us. And a few weeks later, we went to work for him. We were working, and suddenly, we were working on top. And we had the Von Bronner brothers train us, train us, but actually get in the ring and train us every day. And I could tell we were getting better every day. Mm-hmm. So that's uh, really how I started. And uh, I moved to California in 76 permanently. And I came out here. The booker was uh, Leo Garibaldi. And he wouldn't even give me a shot, which I could never understand why. He wouldn't. That's, he could have put me in the ring to see what I could do. Because by then I'd wrestled Jack Briscoe and Danny Hodge and a lot of other people you know, mm-hmm. in St. Louis. So, uh, but I never had any luck with Ernest with uh, Garibaldi. But then Tom Ernesto came in as Booker, and the territory was going downhill fast, real fast. And I thought, well, if I can't talk him into using me now, I might as well give up. So I went and talked to Ernesto, and in five minutes I talked him in. We talked him into meeting with us in his office. So Dan and I went down to his office. We told him all the heat we could get. He said, oh, show me. So we cut a, started cutting a promo for him. After about 30 seconds, he stopped and says, okay, I'll use your Sunday San Bernardino. So then we went to work for him. And on uh, work four days a week, and he'd pay you 75 bucks a week, every week. And he's paying everybody that. We were feuding with Chris Adams and Ringo Rigby at the time, and Carlos Monta and uh, Mondo Guerrero. And they were getting 75 bucks a week, too. Everybody was. I'd go up and work for Anton Leon up in Bakersfield on Saturdays. He'd give me 150 for one night. So I was making double in one night what LaBelle paid me all week. And finally, LaBelle just... I worked the last show at the sports arena here in Los Angeles, me and Mondo Guerrero. They told us to go to a 30 minute Broadway. And after about 10 minutes, I told Mondo, I said, why don't you just pin me so we can get out of here? There's hardly anybody there. And he said, okay. So I let him pin me and that was it. Ernesto never said a word about it. Uh, I think everybody was kind of doing their own finishes at that point. And a few months later, LaBelle was, well, he thought he was in partnership with McMahon, but McMahon cut him out after I think two shows here. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. in 1981, I was up in Bakersfield. I met Dr. Jerry Graham. Uh, John Tolos was there and asked, I was there with Kurt Brown. And he called, John called Kurt over and said, Give, give Jerry Graham a ride home. And so I was driving, and so Kurt came and asked me, he said, Jerry wants a ride home. I'd never met him. I said, Okay. I mean, I'd heard wild stories about him. I figured it couldn't be true. Well, after meeting him and hanging out with him for till he died, a lot of those stories were true and probably worse. But he was a real maniac. And every time I was with him, there's some something happened. I mean, he'd cause trouble somewhere and get thrown out, thrown out of places. But it was all actually pretty funny. Jerry, he just uh, he was a real smart guy. But once he got once he got drunk and the, hit him, he'd go into his world-famous rant, and it's rant so obscene that I don't even want to repeat it, but <laughs> it's uh, the same rant he always used when he get, he'd start in on it, and uh, it, it was funny. Sometimes he'd just sit there in the car and he'd yell out the window, just yell at anybody and everybody, uh-huh. and he'd take his empty liquor bottles and throw them out my car window. i say, stop doing that. <laughs> But he'd never listen to me, but he'd keep throwing them out the window. Yeah. So I was taking Don Morocco and Jimmy Snuka to the airport one night. They were feuding with each other at the time. 
and Jerry was with me, of course. And once Jerry threw the bottle out the window, then Morocco and Snooka started throwing bottles out the window, beer bottles out the window. But once I got to the LAX airport, I thought, oh, no. But I got him out of the car finally and got Jerry back to his hotel and getting his 400 pounds up two flights of stairs is like an hour's work in itself and he was because he was drunk. Uh-huh. But that was nothing new. Every time we brought Jerry home, we had to get him up the stairs. The more people we had, the easier it was. Mm-hmm. So Jerry was a real maniac, but he was always nice to me. I always got along with him, never got in a fight with him or argument. Mm-hmm. But all the stories people tell about Jerry Graham or you hear are all true. Yeah. When you say he's a maniac, well, what, give us some examples. Of- well, we were sitting in the dressing room one night down in Los Angeles Sports Arena when WWF or WWF, or WWF back then were in town. And Andre the Giant was having a big battle of the Giants with John Studd. Well, I knew that was not going to be a good match because Andre was practically crippled by then. And Studd was never that great of a worker. So I, we were just sitting in the dressing room. As soon as Andre, he came in with, uh, I think, two gallons of wine. And before his match, he drank the one gallon, left the other gallon sitting there. Well, that was his first mistake. She'd never leave an empty or a full bottle of liquor sitting in our Jerry Graham and leaving the room because he'll take it. And Jerry did. He took it and drank the whole thing. Andre come back after the, the match about five minutes later. And says, where's my wine? Where's my wine? And Pat Patterson, who hated Jerry, ratted out Jerry, said, oh, he took it. Jerry took it. And Jerry, by then, he was starting to try to get out the door. The back, the, like the big catacomb surrounds the outside of the arena. And Jerry got out the door. Then Andre went after him. And, and there was a sight, 400-pound Jerry Graham trying to run from Andre, who could barely move. Uh-huh. And I caught up to Andre. I said, hang on. I said, I said, Jerry was just ribbing you. I said, I'll get you another bottle of wine. So Andre said, okay, boss, okay. So I settled that down. Another time we had a drinking contest with Andre and Jerry at the Hilton Hotel in downtown L.A. I said, which one of you guys can drink the most? Jerry thought he could keep up with Andre, but there was no way. Pretty soon Jerry was hollering his rant and and Andre just drank till he passed out. And the bartender told us, well, you got to move him out of here. I said, how are we going to move 500-pound man out of here? So I guess he just left him there overnight. <laughs> and the next time they gave her time, we went back to the bar. We were at the bar after WWF was in town. And uh, Jerry walked in to the bartender said, where's Andre? He says, who? He says, Andre, call his room. He said, Andre who? He says, well, the giant. Andre the giant. He saw all seriousness on his face. He expected the guy. The guy didn't even know about wrestling, really. He was a bartender there. And uh, I thought that was pretty funny. And Jerry would do things like, he'd say, stop here. And we'd pull in and walk into a biker bar, and he'd get in a, he'd intensely pick fights with people and throw them at me. <laughs> And uh, that was actually, I was doing steroids at the time, so I was in a mean mood most of the time anyway, so I didn't care. I actually enjoyed it. And he told me other stories of stuff he's done that, like he was in, uh, when he was working for the Sheik, he was driving to the matches, he was already in his trunks and boots, and his car had a flat tire. And he didn't know what to do. So he gets out of the car, opens up his hood, Blazed himself from ear to ear, standing there in the middle of the street in his wrestling attire, bleeding. Somebody stopped to help him. He jumps in the car, says, quick, get me to the TV studio. And I don't know, I don't know what the driver thought, but uh, Jerry got, got to the TV studio. And that was the first story I had really heard about him. Bill Miller told me that in St. Louis, Dr. Bill Miller. And... Uh, I asked Jerry, is that true? He goes, well, yeah, that was true. I said, what about the time he went skin driving, skin diving drunk and almost drowned? He goes, oh, yeah, that was true. I was down with Eddie in Florida. So everything I'd heard about him, he was lighting cigars with $100 bills. He did that. 
he took the Vince McMahon you know, Jr. was his favorite. Jerry was yeah. his favorite wrestler so when he was a kid. Mm-hmm. And then oh, McMahon Sr. didn't like it, but Jerry would take him around. He even bleached his hair, Jr.'s hair blonde at one point, <laughs> platinum blonde, so he could look like Jerry. So Jerry always had these great ideas and stuff. I wonder if some of them rubbed off on, uh, on Vince. Junior, yeah. but what he's done to it now, I don't know. I can only watch about half of it. Well, why did uh, Pat Patterson hate uh, Jerry Graham so much? I don't know, but uh, exactly. Jerry hated any foreigner and even Canadians, he especially hated Canadians. I never knew why, but something must have happened up in Canada. And he was one of the first guys to help train Patterson. But something happened between them, and they, he hated it. Every time we come there to go in the dressing room or whatever, he hated it. But Red Bastien was running the shows, and he, he liked us, and he let us in. He liked Jerry. And, uh, I guess I should tell this story now about Pat. Mm-hmm. We were at the hotel bar one night. I was sitting next to Andre, and Pat was on the other side of me. And I'd gone out drinking with him a lot of times. I knew he was gay. I didn't care. I mean, it didn't matter to me. Mm-hmm. And I talked to him about it. I said, well, I said, you see we're coming in? Vince flew uh, Jerry to New York to be on Tuesday Night Titans. And he pushed our coming in. The Graham Wolf Pack was coming in. I said, you see, I said, you see we're coming in? He said, what? And he said, I said, we're coming in. He said, you see Tuesday Night Titans? I said, Jerry was on there. And Patterson said, God damn it. And he says, oh, I, said, I don't really care about anything. He said, why don't you come up to my room? He said, I want to give you a blowjob. I said, what? He said, I want to give you a blowjob. I said, well, he said, no, not for me. Well, said, does that make me a bad guy? He said, I said, no, but it makes you a cocksucker. <laughs> and that was the end of the WWF relationship. Uh, no, uh, so, so he offered to, uh, to, to, uh, pleasure you with the, with the blow job, not reverse. But, uh, now, um, when you went on the, the Donahue show and, and talked about that, like, uh, how did, uh-huh. how did, uh, Phil Donahue show contact you? How did they know? About was it? Did you contact them, or did the show contact you? Well, I wrote a letter to Dave Meltzer when Barry Orton came out and accused Patterson and Terry Garvin of, and Terry Garvin tried the same thing with me in Tennessee in '73. But I, went, I wrote a letter to Dave for the Wrestling Observer, and he printed it, telling him exactly what happened. And then uh, I guess Donnie he sent it to Donnie or something. And, Donahue called me. At first, I thought it was a rib. I hung up on him. Mm-hmm. And he called back. And it was actually Phil Donahue himself called back. And I realized, oh, that is him. So that's how I got on the show. He flew me to New York, put me on the show. And uh, I didn't really say get out what I wanted to because I wanted to cut a promo on Vince and yell at him and slam my hand on the table. And Bruno San Martino and Meltzer and Superstar Grandma said, no, no, don't do that. It'll make our side look bad. But the way the show came out, I think our side looked bad anyway. Half the people still believe McMahon. And I regret to this day that I didn't do that. No, well, uh, when you said you are going to cut a promo on, do you mean uh, like a wrestling promo? Well, just some, say stuff like Yeah, that? I was going to call him a needle-nosed weasel and <laughs> just, just basically, yeah, I'll cut a wrestling promo yeah. on him. And that would have that everyone would have remembered that. I mean, that would be uh, that'd be infamous. Every today, people would still be talking about it if that would have happened. Yeah, exactly. And uh, yeah, I should have cut loose on him, but I didn't. Now, did I didn't you... say much that whole show. Although about eight months later, Geraldo Rivera called me, flew me back to New York to tell the story. He let me go, say whatever I wanted to. So I talked for about ten minutes. And but Harado stopped me once and said, No remember, this is just his opinion. We're not saying we're not saying this is true. Uh, he was afraid he'd get sued. Right, right. And I think Vince did threaten to sue him. That, did you ever have any interaction with Vince besides uh, the Donahue show? Uh no. 
Although before the show, it was pretty funny. We were all sitting in the green room. I was sitting there with a superstar, and, and every, we're all sitting there. And Phil Downey walks in with Vince with him. Mm-hmm. Nobody said a word to Vince. You could just feel the tension as soon as he walked in the room. Uh-huh. Vince said, hello, boys. Nobody said a word to him. And so Vince left, left the room. Mm-hmm. And then everybody started arguing, who's going to sit next to Vince? So I'm not sitting next to him. I'm not sitting next to him. And I, and Superstar said, if I sit next to him, I'm going to hit him. I said, I'll sit next to him. So I offered to sit next to him on the panel there. And he and I started kind of edging each other, trying to push each other off the chairs with our elbows. I don't know if that really showed off on TV or not, but uh. Vince and I had about a five-minute elbow <laughs> tussle there, just shoving each other back and forth as we were sitting there. And... But that show really didn't amount to much, because mm-hmm. uh, Donahue didn't do his research on it. He thought Vince was making billions a year then, and he wasn't. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, Job's here in the chat room. I don't know. Uh, Job's here uh, in our chat room wants to know: Was uh, were you informed of the findings of Vince's "quote unquote" internal investigation of the sexual abuse allegations? Uh yes. I was, and uh, all I can say, I told him the truth, and I know Barry Orton told him the truth, mm-hmm. and so did Bruno. Superstar Graham, I think he got carried away. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I just, I just told him the truth. Mm-hmm. Did, now, was that an isolated incident with uh, with Pat Patterson, or? Uh... Has anything like that ever happened to you before in wrestling? It with WWF or with you know any other wrestling company? Well, down in Tennessee for Nick Goulas, my our, my second day in there, Sam Bass. I don't know if anybody remembers him. He was a manager and wrestler down there. He said, "Watch out for Terry Garvin; he'll hit on you." And sure enough, he did. But I I just told him no. And when I was wrestling in Mexico, El Solitario, he was bisexual. And I, I wrestled him every night I was down there, but he kept trying to pick me up, keep coming over, wagging his penis in front of my face. I told him, hey, I'm not interested, okay? So finally he backed off. We got along okay and worked okay together, but that's the only time anything gay like that ever happened to me. Mm-hmm. Now, with the Patterson thing, because you said on the Donahue show, um, it was like if you wanted to to come to the WWF and uh, and work for him that you know you would have had to. Oh yeah, he said. Yeah, I said. I said. How do you like for coming? He said. Well, there's two two chances. He says slim and none. And I said, well. <laughs> and then after that, I couldn't even. I called Vince. He wouldn't even answer the phone. Wouldn't talk to me. Mm-hmm. I mean, his secretary answered the phone, but he said he's always in a meeting. He's in a meeting. He's in a meeting. Which is. And I confronted him about it, and he just, uh, you know, I never, never talked to him since. Do you think, uh, do you think Vince knew of, uh, knew about all this before, like, it came out, uh, you know, because you, you mentioned this, too, and it's, uh, in the book, um, if you go back and look at, like, superstars and stuff, you can hear all these inside jokes and stuff with, um, with uh, Gorilla Monsoon and Bobby Heenan, uh, like right. you know, when like the Brooklyn Brawler comes out and they say, like, "Oh, you know, he went to the Pat Patterson School of Self Defense." Right. And uh, they even do stuff about um, uh, the one guy who was into like the kids' feet. They would like mention stuff about feet and stuff. So, like, do you think it was just well known, like uh, throughout the the company? Well, throughout the end of business, it was known. Yeah, I think I'd say most of the wrestlers knew it. I, well, they all knew it. I would say they had to. I mean, it was no secret. Patterson, when he came out you know, last year or whatever, <laughs> it was you know like forty years too late because everybody already knew it. He never hit it, really. Yeah, but I, mean, uh, I I saw a uh, Roddy Piper stand up actually uh, a year before uh, that show, and uh, he was uh-huh. talking about how Patterson um, he he. He he didn't say exactly what happened, but he insinuated that Patterson like molested him when he was like uh, a late teen, uh, getting into wrestling, and that's why he never liked him. 
But then on the show, he's acting like it was a, you know, like this, no one knew that Patterson was gay and it was a big secret. He even uh, joked about it on the, uh, on the um, stand-up I saw, saying, oh, well, yeah, what a, you know, what a great, you know, kept secret this was. This was before the show aired, but it was just, right. uh, it was, you know, just obvious that everyone knew it anyway, but they I, I don't know what, what I guess to have look good for the company like PR. Hey, we've got this you know gay guy coming out of the closet. But. Oh yeah, I still there's still people that don't believe me. They believe Vince all the way. That's, that's, that's their prerogative. But you know, I know the truth. I was there, and uh, I don't know what else I can tell them. Yeah. Now, was it something where like um, uh, like for Barry Orton and stuff like where they would have had to uh you know, have sex with Pat, whoever, and, uh, you know, to get a push or something? Or was it more just this guy happens to be gay and he's hitting on you, and like you said, in Mexico, you said, ah, you know, I'm not interested, and they would just leave you alone? Oh, uh, yeah, they just leave me alone. In fact, uh, I guess if I hadn't called Patterson a cocksucker, maybe they would have brought me <laughs> in, but I probably wouldn't have lasted more than two weeks. So I would have gotten a fight with Vince or an argument with him, and he, I'm sure I would have quit or got fired. But, yeah, I mean, everybody knew it, and uh, it was no big deal, really. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you think, uh, you know, there's always been, uh, you know, different wrestlers said there's uh, stuff with McMahon and, like, Shawn Michaels stuff. Do you believe any anything like that? Mm, not really. With Shawn Michaels, although I don't know Shawn, but mm -hmm. I don't think so. Yeah. Although you never know. They claim that's how Tommy Rich got the world title, Jim Barnett, but I didn't really believe that either. So, mm -hmm. uh, did you know? Did you ever have any interaction with him, Jim Barnett? Uh, no. When I was when I was down in Georgia, I guess I think he was. God, I don't remember. Well, he wasn't around. I know that Ernesto was doing the booking for Paul Jones and uh no I just don't remember uh in the chat room Job wants to know are you surprised that uh WWE has pushed Randy Orton uh so hard considering his uncle uh came out against Vince well no not really uh I think Randy's a good worker in spite of what a lot of people say. I think he's really good. And uh, I think he worked his way up. I mean, uh, I don't think anybody ever got punished or not pushed because of it. Okay. The, the guys that thought they were going to get pushed usually weren't. It's like the Jim Wilson. I don't remember him. But he wrote a book about inside the NWA or something like that. And he wrote all about my experience in there. Thought my I didn't even know he was writing it. And he got some stuff wrong. But uh, he he complained about Jim Barnett constantly. And when we did Phil Donahue, they said, Barnett's watching us closely. They're afraid we're going to mention his name. I said, well, I said, I won't mention it. So nobody mentioned his name or said anything. Uh, have you ever but, had... Yeah, go on, sorry. Go, no, go ahead. All right, you finish what you're going to say, th then I'll ask the next one. I was going to say, no, but there's... I was going to say, there's been openly gay guys in wrestling for yeah. forever. Mm -hmm. Just fans never knew it. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm actually glad you said that, because uh, the way you, that comes out to me is like, if it just happens to be a gay guy and he hits on another grown man and they're not interested, to me there's not really a big deal there. As opposed to, like, yeah. you have to, you know, do something, you know, to get the job here or something. That's a totally different, you know, uh, deal, obviously. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. And, in fact, that's why Geraldo Rivera had me on. He had a same-sex harassment in the workplace. And he called me up and wanted me to, so I went on there. And, it's, yeah, I feel, I'm sure what I said to Patterson is what stopped our WWF run before it started we had uh, Joe Johnson and Mike Bowman, both from Los Angeles. Well, Joe's in, actually in Ohio, and he we trained him. He got into the business, his, works as a, as a Russian for a long time. I can't remember what name he used. And uh, 
I, I don't know. It's just uh, we trained him. Actually, we trained a lot of guys, but only a few actually you know, really got in the business. So what were you guys going to be when, when you went to, if you went to WWF? It was going to be the Graham Wolf Pack. Jerry got on TV and said, it comes full circle, Vince, full circle. Started with me and Eddie, and then it went me and Luke, and then Superstar, and now I'm back with my boys. It's been full circle. We're going to be the Golden, or the Graham Wolf Pack. That's what he called us. So he's going to be like your manager? Yeah. Uh, that would have been pretty cool. Um See here. Um, Al Wolf here in the chat wants to know uh, what are your thoughts on uh, Dave Meltzer and uh, in the dirt sheets. Uh, I've been reading it ever since he started putting it out. The first time I took it in the dressing room, I think it was in Bakersfield one night. The guy goes, "Oh, it's a mark sheet." I said, "No, it's not." I said, "He knows more than you do about the business." Uh-huh. And they first soon they're looking at it. Next thing I know, they're all reading it, all looking it over. And pretty soon, I know some of them became, you know, correspondents for him. And I like what he's doing. I, uh, although he just a lot into MMA now, and I'm not that big into that. Yeah, I get that. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, I think he does a great job, and I read his website every day. Mm-hmm. And uh, a lot of people hate him and badmouth him. I don't understand why. Like. Like he was the one that blew K Fabe, but it certainly wasn't him. Yeah. And uh Especially, I've met Dave a few times and I've always gotten along with him. Especially like mainstream, like, you know, because, uh, you know, only, only like real hardcore wrestling fans would have read The Observer and they would have known anyway. But I mean, you know, no. Vince McMahon himself came out on, on the show and, and on the show itself and said it's not real, so. Plus, I'm like you, even when I was a little kid watching it, I I never, like, thought this was, like, legit competition. But it never mattered at all to me. I just enjoyed it. I mean, just like if yeah, I watch exactly. a TV show, I don't, you know, believe dragons are real or they're zombies. But it doesn't matter. I enjoy the show, you know. Yeah, exactly. And I was always curious, oh, how do these guys bleed? And I, you know, I'd watch them and I'd see them. I'd see, watch Ronnie Etchison one night in Iowa. I was a kid, he crawled under the ring, but he didn't like the blade, I guess. He barely barely cut himself. And but then I saw I saw him do it and he came out with a little bit of blood coming down. And uh and I realized well, he said he did something to his head. And then I real I found out about you know blades and how he did it with the blades. And uh to me that didn't seem out of the ordinary. I mean, professional wrestling, anything goes. Yeah. It made it that much more intriguing to me. Mm-hmm. Now, when you talked earlier about, like, training in the backyard with your friend, so you didn't have, like, a wrestler at all, like, uh, to, you know, train you guys? You were, like, kind of like you would watch the wrestling on TV and, like, try to uh, learn how to do the moves without, you know, like, hurting each other? Was that, like, how your training went? Yeah, and we talked to Harley Race a lot. He never actually got in the ring with us because he lived in Kansas City, and he was when he came up to Iowa, he was only there, you know, one or two days. But we got to talk to him, and Gus Karras introduced me to introduced us to him. And uh, Harley, after he kept telling us, "Oh, it's impossible to get in the business. You guys' hair's too long, because we had the hair down to our shoulders." And he says, "But we kept." Maybe more or less stalking him or bugging him constantly. And uh, so one night he took us out to dinner. After, that was before the matches. He's one of the few guys that could sit down and eat a huge meal before a match and still go out there and work for 60 minutes. It was unbelievable to me. And he sat down there and laid, told, us, told, me his, told us his plans, how he's going to work St. Louis and Japan and how he's going to get the world title. And this is in 1970, I think he told us this. And uh, his plan worked all right. And he helped us. He showed us how to shake hands and told us you got to learn how to lose before you win. And this all made sense to me. So he was, like, open about it. And do uh, you think he saw something in you guys? Or he just, you know, was that just... I well, Gus somebody... Karras, mm-hmm. when Harley was there, when we were Gus, Gus Karras, he says, you, got, you boys remind me of the Funk Brothers. It didn't mean by wrestling. It was just our knowledge of the business because we'd studied it for years. We knew 
at the time we knew where everybody was wrestling, where what cities, what territories, and we knew the history of the business. And Gus Karras told us taught us a lot more about it. And Bobby Bruns is another guy, former world champion. He was uh, he didn't get in the ring with us, and he was getting too old by that point. But he you know gave us a few pointers and helped us out. But the uh, here in the chat room, too, I uh, want to know uh, your thoughts on Murray Hodgson's uh, recanting his allegations, and do you feel that it has tarnished your own accusation against, uh, accusations against Patterson? Uh, no, because my, my accusations were true. And uh, actually, Murray's might have been, although I don't think too highly of him. I mean, he was definitely gay. He was there with his gay lawyer for the show. And uh, I never, I don't know, I never, I never liked him for some reason. But I, he thought he was going to be more than he was, and I think he was just bitter about it and using that as an excuse. Mm -hmm. And he was gay, and Patterson knew it, and I guess he wasn't interested, and that was that. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard the Kamala song uh, "Push It and Pull It"? Yeah. Uh, do, you, do you have any thoughts on that? Oh, I think it's great. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, too. It's, I played on the song a lot, because uh, I think it's pretty hilarious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. I used to watch these uh, podcasts, Kamala oh, yeah, and Kamala too. Jr., yeah. or on YouTube. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, and I, I liked them. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's too bad, you know, uh, over the last couple of years, he's had a lot of health problems through uh, yeah. his diabetes. Cause, uh, we've had him on the show a few times. He's always a super nice guy. Have you ever... Oh, yeah, I met him in Atlanta. He was real nice. I got a concussion down there. Johnny Walker dropped, kicked me so hard, he gave me a concussion. And I couldn't see. And I had to carry me back to the dressing room. And uh, Abdul was the first one there to see if I was okay. And he says, sounds like you got a concussion. So just relax. Mm -hmm. And he was right. I did have a concussion. Mm -hmm. And that put me out for almost a year. Oh, wow. And that nowadays you probably wouldn't be it. You, they, you probably you might not ever come back. You know, it's like a, you can cut probably you. not. Some of these guys, I see the injuries, so-called injuries they get. That I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, when you talked about uh, the blades earlier, so um, when they showed you that, like, uh, now who showed you how to blade? And the first time you blade, did you blade yourself, or did someone else blade you? No, I always bladed myself. I never had any qualms about it. Uh, I guess it was when I was in uh, Tennessee working for Goulas. Mm -hmm. And they told us they wanted four-way blood in a tag match, four-way juice. And the referee had the blade and ha would hand it to us when, he wanted us when they wanted us to juice. So mm -hmm. that was the first time I did it. I think it was Bowling Green, Kentucky. And it uh, didn't bother me. Mm -hmm. And uh, it never bothered me. When I was in Mexico... I made the mistake of letting Mil Mosker throw me into the ring post, and I, you know, he hit me with the chair. That's what it was. And I didn't block it. I thought, oh, I'm just going to take this and blade. So I did that, and I didn't get approval from the commission, apparently, ahead of time. And they fined me $25 for bleeding. Really? That's pretty... So I didn't bleed anymore down there until I got their permission first. Yeah. So. The, the first time you said the ref gave you the blade, after that, was it something you'd carry yourself to the ring? Uh, yeah, I always carried them in my wrist, wrist wraps and in my boots. So I had like four of them in case I'd lose them or something. Mm -hmm. Is a, What's a trick to making one? Is you just like cut a piece of a razor blade? or? Yeah, just cut a piece of razor blade and wrap a bunch of adhesive tape around it. So just the point of the blade sticking out. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah, just... Got to have the guts to put it up your head and drag it across or down, whatever you want to do. Yeah. Is there was there any tricks? Before I always you... went sideways, I guess. <laughs> was there any tricks to? Because uh, I've always heard like uh, to, to take like aspirin beforehand would make you like bleed more because it thin out the blood. Is there was there any tricks like that? Mm, not that I ever saw. Mm -hmm. Not that I ever really heard of, but yeah, that could make you bleed more, definitely. Yeah, I I read in Ivan uh, Koloff's book, also by Crowbar Press, 
uh, actually, is uh, he would hide them in his mouth, which always seemed like uh, crazy to me. That's what Jerry Graham did. He kept them in his mouth. And I thought, Jesus, Jerry. I said, I'd fucking slip my throat <laughs> if I did that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, but uh, Jerry always carried them in his mouth. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why, but uh, there's some guys that still do. So, uh, what territories, uh, like, how many different territories had you worked for? Well, I worked Tennessee, Kentucky, Georgia, Central States, I know I'm forgetting somewhere, California, Mexico, and Hawaii. Out of all those, where which ones were, like, your, your favorite places to work and uh, your least favorite? Well... Actually, Hawaii was uh, my favorite place to be, and I liked working there, too, but the promoter, the booker, was Lars Anderson, and I don't know if you know about Lars, but he's a real dick, and I'll tell him so to his face if he wants me to, uh-huh. and uh, so it was always like a screaming match between me and him over the payoffs every night, but I always came out and got what I wanted from him, so I liked wrestling over there. And the fans just hated me over there. I was under a mask, Mr. Z. And they, I'd walk around you know, Honolulu with a mask on in the daytime just to get attention. And uh-huh. people would yell stuff at me. And I thought, oh, great, Getting, building up business. Uh-huh. A, I, you know, I, I, you know, I know of Lars, but he's a little bit before my time. And uh, I met Ole Anderson uh, a bunch of times. I know they're not really related, but uh, they both right. have similar... Uh, uh, stories about them. What, what is it about Lars that, that made him a dick? Oh, he wouldn't he wouldn't pay people. Like my friend Moondog Moretti went to New Zealand for him and worked. And uh, he took off and left Moretti there with no ticket and no money. That's just one of the things. He's, plus, he's a big bully and tries to be in the dressing room. But he was a booker and he's a bully. The only person I ever heard that could out yell him besides me, and I could out yell him and out argue him, was Leah Maivia, the promoter there, Peter Maivia's wife. Mm-hmm. But she, she was. They were taking me to the airport one day, and they got into an argument, screaming at each other. And Leah had to pull over to the side of the road to concentrate on arguing, and you screaming at Lars. And I'd never heard anything like it. it was, but I enjoyed listening to it. But I was late for my flight. Uh-huh. Yeah. Stuck in Hawaii another day. Uh, that you, was okay. Did you? Uh, did you? And meet uh, go ahead. I would say, did you ever meet a, a young rock at the time? Yes, I did. Uh, they had a big show, and oh, I think it was August. It was August fifth, nineteen eighty-five, at the Aloha Stadium, and uh, Rock was—he was fourteen years old then, and his father was doing the booking right then even though Lars was still around. But Rocky was doing the booking. And yeah, I talked to him a little bit, and uh, he's a nice kid. And I was surprised to see how huge his star has become. Yeah. Yeah, and, you know, not just in wrestling. He's, uh, like, the biggest uh, movie star at the moment. The highest paid. And yeah. It's pretty crazy. And uh, I guess Cena's going to try to uh, follow in the footsteps because he came out that he came out that he's going to be part-time now, and he's going to try to, uh, uh, you know, go into acting in Hollywood. Well, that should be interesting. I think I saw him on, he was on Night something Live. the other day. Yeah, he was on Saturday Night Probably Live. an old movie. But uh, yeah. I don't think he'll get over like The Rock did. I don't think so either. It's uh, That's like one of a kind kind of uh, charisma there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, what was uh, Soul Man like, uh, Rocky Johnson? Uh, he was he was real nice. I actually only got to meet him uh, a couple times in Hawaii. He just came in for the big show, and he booked it. He booked Bruiser Brody and a lot of the Japanese guys. I think there were 54 wrestlers on that card, and it lasted like almost six hours. Mm-hmm. Wow. And I think there were 13,000 fans there. And, uh, but Rocky, uh, Oh, he was always nice. And his brother, this is was his legitimate brother. It was his tag team partner then too. Mm-hmm. Rocky and Ricky Johnson. Um, you mentioned earlier about uh, you were on steroids at one point in time. 
Uh, what are your thoughts on steroids? And because uh, we've actually had you know people on that they think uh, they they're good for wrestling. You know, if you use in moderation. What are your thoughts on steroids? As someone who's actually used right. them, right? I think it's up to everybody what they want to do. But I can see what it is doing to my body. It was, I mean, I gained twenty pounds of muscle. But I was lifting heavy weights every day. And I did gain 20 pounds, and I started, I was taking Dianabol, which turns out, and I took pills. I didn't inject it. I thought that was safer. It turns out taking the pills was the worst way to take that stuff. And uh, after a few weeks, I broke out, and my urine turned cloudy, and I thought, this got to be from those steroids. So I quit taking them and became a food supplement junkie. So I was taking, like, 22 different food supplements after each meal, and I kept my weight up to, like, 230. Mm-hmm. Well, what were you before, like, uh, you got into wrestling? Were you a smaller uh, guy? Or? Uh, I weighed about probably 200, 185, 200 mm-hmm. before I really started. When I first got into it, I actually, I weighed, when I was working down south for Nick Goose, couldn't afford to eat most of the time. I got down to 185 at one point. Mm-hmm. Did, but did, I tried to stay at 200 or above. Yeah. Did the steroids affect your personality at all? Oh, yeah, they made me mean. Or, like when Jerry Graham would take me places when you get in fights, I would actually enjoy it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I like, I, in the ring, I could tell the difference, too. I was just, uh, more aggressive, which I should have been anyway, but I was working for California Championship Wrestling by then, and they were in the pits. And I was ready to quit, and uh, but I didn't. Didn't. Luckily, I came back and went to Hawaii and Mexico, where I had my best matches. And the, when Mel Moskers let me pin him, I couldn't. Be, I couldn't believe wow. it. Wow, I know that's like unheard a, of. We were in a tag match, uh-huh. so both partners had to be pinned on there. And out of the blue, he says, "Pin me." I go, "What?" He said, "Pin me now, quick." And I hadn't used the legal hold the whole match. <laughs> So I just kicked him in the gut and rolled him up in a small package and pinned him. Wow. And uh, I guess I hold that as an honor. Yeah, definitely. That's and I actually got along with him. I got along great with him. He hung out with me, showed me around Mexico. <laughs> but I wrestled him in Solitario. Me and Angel Blanco were a team. We wrestled Solitario and Moscaris every night. That's a, that's really unusual to hear someone say uh, something good about Milo Scars. Usually people have uh, uh, say you know he wasn't a nice guy. So uh, I think that's cool to hear that. Well, when I first met him, he came up to me and told me how much how big a star he was and the other guys were, and, and I should respect him. I said I do respect you. I said I do nothing but the ultimate utmost respect for you. So I know exactly who all of you are. I followed your career. I said I have all respect for you. After I told him that, he was always nice to me, and he sold for me in the ring. What, what was? But Mexico, I didn't give him was, much options. Sometimes I, I tried to keep him grounded, yeah. unless he was going to do one of his moves. What was Mexico itself like? Uh, was it was, well, it was a real shithole? Yeah. It was. It was. It was. It was horrible. Mm-hmm. Food was horrible. The commission was crooked. But uh, I enjoyed wrestling there because the fans got worked up real easy. Mm-hmm. And my first night there, we started a riot in Mexicali. And that was after we lost the match, but the fans came in the ring after me and Blanco anyway. We fought our way back to the back, and then Blanco started speaking English to me. <laughs> Is there, what was it like to work uh, the Mexican, the luchadors? Uh don't they work like the opposite side and a lot of Well, when I asked Mill that, he said, "Don't worry, just work like you usually do." He said, "Solitario." He said he can work. He can work that way too. He said, "If he won't, he said make him." So <laughs> keep slamming him. I said, "Okay." <laughs> so yeah, I just work regular from the left side. Yeah. Uh, Al here in the chat wants to know, uh, what are your thoughts on hardcore wrestling? Well, it depends who it is and how they do it, but I like you know, I like it. Mm-hmm. I uh, used to go to Pro Wrestling Gorilla down here, which isn't really hardcore, mm-hmm. but I, I enjoyed ECW. Mm-hmm. 
and uh, Sabu, the hard. I like the, I like the hardcore wrestlers. Right now, my favorite show is New Japan Pro Wrestling. It's, that's about the only show I watch. That and Lucha Underground. I really like Lucha Underground. Uh, you know, I do too. It's like a whole new concept. Yeah, I think it's a first wrestling in a long time that's actually revolutionary. That's you know actually completely different than any other. Yeah, it is definitely. And, and uh, uh, yeah, Robert Rodriguez, the director, and we put it together. He's he's my favorite director to begin with. I love his movies, and this he tapes it just right. He's got that mat looking looks like it's dirty, and it looks the whole place looking like it's filthy, and that's what he wants. And it looks it's great. Yeah, that's a great show. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree, hundred percent. It's like uh, I don't uh, get some of the people who, uh, you know, like uh, Jim Cornette really uh, went off on it. You know, like and, oh yeah, and wanted everyone to like die yeah. in it and stuff. And I was like, I, I don't. Uh, I mean, everyone knows. Like we said, especially now, no one there's unless maybe like a couple kids or someone like in a hillbilly or some believes like wrestling is legit. So I don't see you know why even pretend at this point. You know what I mean? But with well, yeah, the and itself, this, I look at Lucha Underground as like part science fiction, part drama, comedy, and wrestling. Because like they, who I forget who was dead, and they brought him back from the dead. Is it Mil Martes? I think. Yeah. yeah, and it's fun to see like uh, like the Honky Talk Man. You have like a cameo on it, and he's not the. Honky oh yeah, Talk I Man, saw that. Yeah, you it's, know, it's it's the fun. police department. Yeah, yeah, it's just you know it's. It's fun too. It's just a fun show. Plus, it's an hour. Yeah, and the guy that plays the promoter, I saw him on some other show the other night. I didn't yeah. realize he was he'd been around so long as an actor. Uh-huh. Yeah. I don't remember his real name, but he does a good job too. Yeah, he does. Um, let's see here, James here in the chat said, "What do you think of modern women's wrestling?" Uh, it's better than it was in the past. I would say. Yeah. But it's the same as the men's wrestling. It's evolved. I mean, I can't you can't really compare it to 60s and 70s wrestlings. I, mean, I know a lot of guys my age. I'm 68. They hate the new wrestling. They hate all the high flying moves. But and they don't like the, all these women wrestlers. But I disagree. Jerry Graham told me in '85. He says it's all going to be high flying someday. It's all going to be high flying. And he teaching me these moves that I'd never seen before. And he was exactly right. Uh, what kind of style uh, would you say you wrestled? Uh, well, I tried to copy Buzz Sawyer, but I was never the mat wrestler he was. But I could be a maniac as like he was. I mean, I, my interviews were always like off the charts me going berserk and uh i cheated a lot but when i wrestled jack briscoe uh that was, was a different story <laughs> he taught me more in three minutes than i learned in a year i think uh what was that but that was what was that like being in the ring with you know uh someone of that caliber uh well, it was amazing. I've never been in the ring with anybody that fast before or after that. But as soon as we tied up, man, he had control the whole, of me con- through the whole match. Because we, we just planned the finish out where Harley Race came out and interfered in the finish. And uh, otherwise, we didn't plan anything. He said, well, we'll just get down on the mat and mat wrestle for three minutes. I said, Jack, I said, I can't keep up with you mat wrestling when if I worked for three hours, I said, but we'll give it a shot. So we did. But, like, you know, I found myself, he, he was in the corner, and I was punching him in the face. But he actually had my hand. It looked like he was trying to hold it back, and he was doing all the work. I was just standing there. So he was, I think, the best wrestler, him and Danny Hodge, mm-hmm. that I ever wrestled. Mm-hmm. Uh, they always talk about Danny Hodge's uh, uh, tendon strength in his hands. Oh yeah, he well, he does. Uh, yeah, I had dinner with him a few years ago, and uh, I said, "Boy, I wish you were around uh, 1969 to train me." He said, "Well, it's never too late." And he <laughs> clamped on a hold on me. I was sitting at the dinner table. Luthez was sitting next to him, 
This is a couple months before Lou died, and he didn't look good, but Lou started laughing because Danny locked me up in this lock. He said, see, you do this. If you move your head, you'll break your neck. I said, yeah, I can see that. <laughs> and both his wife and my wife got embarrassed, but Lou Thez was sitting there laughing his ass off, and I thought it was pretty funny, too. Uh, that's an awesome story. Uh, that's, that's, that's pretty cool, too, to uh, to have eaten, uh, had dinner with uh, Lou Thez. Uh, yeah. It was. You could tell he wasn't feeling good. He died like two months after that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember. That was one of the few times I saw him smile at, <laughs> uh, at that like, convention. Uh, we mentioned uh, Meltzer earlier. When I first got online and I found uh, Wrestling Observer Live and was on five days a week on IATA, and he would have Luthez. Oh, yeah, I remember on. that, yeah. yeah. And he'd have Luthez on sometimes. And I always uh, really. I know he's kind of. A grumpy old guy, but I was really in, in, enjoyed listening to him. I thought he was, uh, and uh, he was selling his book at the time, uh, Hooker. They re-released it, and I was really happy because I got a, an autographed copy of the Luthez's book, which I don't think many people have. But. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm lucky. I got a book here, World Title Histories by I think it was oh, Royal Duncan. And I got Lou and Danny Hodge. I got everybody that was at the CAC that year. It must have been 2004 or something like that to autograph it for me. And I still got it here. It's one of the few things I still have left. That's but, yeah, to have Lou and Nick Bockwinkle's name all there on the same page, mm-hmm. I think I, uh, I'm really proud of that. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I remember when he when uh, Lou was on the Yada show. I remember a caller called in once and asked him what he thought of Shawn Michaels, and he just went, "Is he a wrestler, or is he one of them there tumblers?" And I just thought it was it was just really made me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> that he even consider him like even a wrestler. But, uh, it was good. it was great. Uh, let's see here in the chat room. Yeah, I'm sure Lou would hate Lucha Underground. But... <laughs> yeah, if I wouldn't be. A fan. Uh, Ted wants to know if um, Neil Mascaris wore his mask 24-7 when you were around him. Uh, who did? Uh, Neil Mascaris, if you wore the mask uh, all the time. When no. You were no. Uh, just when he went out to the ring. And when he'd leave the building and come in the building, he'd wear it. But he, he, when I first met him, he wasn't wearing it. Mm. And then he'd take it off you know, after the matches or after he'd get away from the building. Then we could go places together. Mm-hmm. Now, so actually, the four of us just hung out together and went to eat together, and nobody was any the wiser. Mm-hmm. Who are some of your favorite guys to travel with? Oh, gosh. I think, uh, you know, Pepe Lopez, if anybody remembers him, down in Tennessee. He was. It was fun, but Sam Bass, actually, I guess Sam and Peppy died in a car wreck. Maybe maybe that's why they were so much fun to ride with. They were wild. I'm glad I wasn't with them yeah. at that point, but riding with them. But actually, Jerry Graham was the best. He had the best stories. He told me stories that are unbelievable, but I believe it. He told me a story about him and Wahoo McDaniel driving down back street in New York City going real fast. They were both drunk. And some bum stepped out in front of him and Wahoo hit the guy with his car and killed him. Oh, God. And they got out and looked. Wahoo said, fuck, we killed the guy. Jerry said, ah, nobody will miss him. Let's go. And they took <laughs> off. <laughs> they took off and left him lying there in the street. Uh, I feel that laugh. I told Jerry I wouldn't tell that story till he was dead. So... <laughs> I love it. Uh, see, uh, uh, Dominic here in the chat room wants to know, what's the worst backstage incident, uh, incident you've ever seen? Worst what? Uh, backstage incident. Oh, well, I watched uh, it was Mitsu Katayanka, and he had a partner. Mitsu is actually a Mexican guy. I can't remember his name, but we had a battle royal that night, and he, oh, no, it wasn't a battle royal. It was a riot. It was in Cleveland, Tennessee. There were about maybe 70 fans there. About half of them decided they were going to get in the ring and fight with Lorenzo Perenni and Bobby Hart. So all the wrestlers emptied out of the dressing room were fighting with the fans. And Mitsu Katayanka kicked Tom Shaft in the teeth, knocked 
few of his teeth out. And I guess it was an accident, but when they got back in the dressing room, Shaft, who was huge compared to Mitsu, just beat the shit out of both these Japanese guys. I just stayed back, stayed out of it. No way I was going to try to break it up. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's the only real fight I've seen. Mm-hmm. Bad fight like that. And that was a little dressing room. There were only four of us in there. Now, were you Were you still... Uh, an active wrestler when uh, when like the territory started to get bought out and uh, they started to dry up. Uh yeah, because uh, I was talking to the Sheik about coming in to Detroit in the '83, but then I thought, no, the payoffs are going to be terrible there because I knew he was going downhill fast. Everybody was, and I called around the. Countries talked to Stu Hart, talked to different promoters. Bob Brown wanted me to come to Kansas City. He said, you can work St. Louis TV, and almost talked me into it, but they weren't paying very good down there either. I could see the whole business was starting to go down the toilet, at least from a WWF standpoint. I still liked WCW mm-hmm. up until a point. So they put Harley Race out in a rowboat with a midget and dynamite or whatever the f- <laughs> they were doing. <laughs> and I said, oh, that's enough of this. <laughs> yeah, cheat him the one-eyed midget. Hammer that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, during that period, though, uh, what, what did, like, all the other wrestlers and promoters that, that you knew, what did they think of Vince McMahon and the WWF? Uh... Well, the ones I know from my era mostly hate him, but uh, some of them like him, I guess. They must, because some of them are still around you know, working for him in various capacities. But uh, you go to like a CAC convention, I'd say 80% of the wrestlers there hate him. Mm-hmm. Uh, what are your thoughts on him? Uh,. I hate what he's done to the business in terms of when he first, when he made Hogan champion, to me, the whole quality of the business dropped into the gutter. Because Hogan was not a a wrestler. I mean, he drew people and made a lot of money, but he couldn't wrestle for shit. And uh, I I could see that was, as I call it, the cartoon era. You get Brutus Beefcake and some of those other gimmicks he had, and I, I didn't like him, although I watched it at the time, but I didn't like it. And uh, I finally just got away from watching WWE. Although, like, well, actually, SmackDown just now came on here, but I hadn't planned on watching it. Mm-hmm. Two o'clock this morning, New Japan Pro Wrestling's on. I'll be up watching that, though. Mm-hmm. Uh, who are some of the guys you liked in, uh, you like in New Japan? Well, AJ Styles was tremendous, and now he's in you know, WWE. But he was just tremendous over there. And just, Tanahashi is another one, and uh, Geet. Uh, there's some. Uh, they got so many good guys. I can't even name them all. And the matches they show on TV are all main event quality, and they're all probably all about six months old. Mm-hmm. So I like the. They got the Bullet Club over there, and they got uh, who's this one guy? Comes to the ring real slow, and he's dressed up, and he's—I can't remember his name. I just started watching him about a month ago. I'm learning all their names now. Yeah, uh, I don't know if you saw it's. Um, I don't. It hasn't been on the TV yet, but the uh, the on YouTube the videos out of uh, Cody Rhodes is going to New Japan, and he's going to be in the Bullet Club. And uh, his new uh, gimmick is the American Nightmare, kind of play on American Dream, but he's American Nightmare. And if you haven't seen it yet, right. you should check it out. I really thought the uh, the video was great. Of him. It's like a vignette of him, you know, coming to New Japan. Yeah, I will check that out. In fact, yeah, I'm anxious to see him come in there. He deserves a good break. Yeah. And uh, what do you think of someone like that who... Uh, you know, gave up his guaranteed money in WWE because he wasn't happy and wanted to, you know, leave. And uh, even well, I think I'd have done the I'd have done the same thing. I think mm-hmm. I'd rather be happy than 
as long as I'm, as long as I can still make money, yeah. I'd rather be happy than work for Vince. Yeah, I mean, I respect. And I know that. I wouldn't be happy working for him. Mm-hmm. So uh, when you do watch WWE, who are some of the guys that uh, that you do like? Oh, I like Randy Orton. I like Roman Reigns. I like. Uh, Gosh, I like AJ Styles. I like, well, they got the Bullet Club there now. Mm-hmm. I like them. I like uh, Blackjack Mulligan's grandkids. Uh, Bray Wyatt. Yeah, Bray Wyatt. That's what I'm trying to think. I like them. When they first came out, I like, uh, actually, most of the guys I like there are guys that came through here, <laughs> Pro Wrestling Gorilla here in Los Angeles. Yeah. Little 600 seat building, and they. They've all been through here, came through here, and I like them all. Kevin Owens, and I like him. I liked him since he was Kevin Steen. Yeah. And uh, I liked El Generico, who's now Sami Zayn. Mm-hmm. So, so is it more they just, have a lot of good workers. Yeah, I was just saying, is it more of the show you don't like as opposed to the, the talent? Because there are, like, a honestly, I think... Yeah, it's the crap though. between the matches that I can't stand. Yeah. At least the stuff on Lucha Underground is entertaining. Yes. It's filmed out, you know, it's not, I don't know, I just, all this backstage stuff they do is, to me, is unnecessary. Mm-hmm. I mean, New Japan doesn't do that. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I want to talk quick about your uh, your music career, because it's also a big part of your book, by the way. People can get that Ooh, okay. at uh, Crowbar Press, The Mat, The Mob, The Music, and, um... Uh, if people don't know, uh, uh, how, what was your involvement in, in music? You, you were in a band, The Untouchables? Yeah, I started a band when I was, well, I don't know, 14 or so in Iowa. And in 1965, we re- went to Chicago and rec- actually got a good recording studio. And we got uh, one of the top blues engineers, one that did the Rolling Stones and Muddy Waters and old Chicago guys like that to, and to engineer it. And we put out a record, and it got a lot of airplay in the Midwest, both sides, double sides. So we moved to Los Angeles, came out here, met Phil Spector, before he killed anybody, as far as I know. <laughs> <All right. laughs> and uh, Unless he was well, driving he didn't Wahoo. shoot me. Yeah, or maybe he was and driving he, with Wahoo one night. Go, go ahead. I was, I was just saying, maybe he was driving with Wahoo one night, but... Uh... <laughs> Go on, sorry. And then I we played our first gig out here was with the Doors, and they hadn't wow. they were unknown at the time. Uh-huh. Although I'd seen them play, I came out here during spring vacation from Iowa. To, we came out here to play at a club out here, that, and I went to the Whiskey A Go Go, and the Doors were opening up for the Chambers Brothers. I'd never heard of them. I thought, what a strange name for a band, the Doors. I went in, they just blew me away. I couldn't believe it. And then when I saw, we were playing down at the Hullabaloo Club, which is a giant club on Sunset Boulevard, this giant marquee, and there was our name, the Orphans, and the doors were opening for us. And I thought, Jesus Christ, how am I going to follow Jim Morrison on stage? (laughs) But we pooled our equipment together and uh, became friends. I became friends with Jim, dropped acid with him, and... We'd sit, sit around and drink beer all day. He'd drop acid and start writing poetry. And uh, some of it was horrible, and some of it turned into great songs. Mm-hmm. How, how would you say uh, uh, acid uh, affects uh, your creativity for you personally? Well, it always enhanced it. To me, I look back at the major decisions I made, like I moved into California, I'm going to be a wrestler, I'm going to do this. I was tripping on acid every decision I made like that, it seems like. So uh, I don't think they make acid like that anymore. So I would probably wouldn't take it these days, but I don't even know if it's around anymore. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it definitely helped my creativity. As far as writing lyrics and so forth. Yeah. So, uh, so you're open for the doors. And you're talking to Jim Morrison. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, he came up. I hadn't seen him, and I felt somebody tap me on the shoulder and he said, "Here, man, want somebody hands me a joint." And I turn around and it's Morrison. I said, "Well, sure. 
Why not? And that was how I met him. And we just, I don't know, we just all became friends. We pl played a couple of high schools here with him and went up to Santa Barbara and played with him. And they finally got signed by, I forget who signed them, Electra or somebody. And uh, I wasn't surprised because they were so incredible. I also got to meet Frank Zappa, too. He was a genius. Mm. He's a guy that never did any drugs or drank or anything. He's just a musical genius. Mm. Do you th did you think there was more uh, drugs in uh, wrestling or the music business? Oh, yeah. I mean, guys have smoked pot forever. I mean, I was in Hawaii last, well, it was 20 years ago, but I was with King Curtis. He was telling me him and Jerry Graham were smoking pot in the late 50s, early 60s, you know, New York City. Don Fargo, another one, I you know, hung, hung around with him, and he, uh, he'd been smoking his whole life. So, yeah, a lot of guys. Now I read on Ivan Koloff said he was high most every match, yeah, it was in his which I was, uh -huh. I was surprised because he was such a good worker. Yeah. Now, is that something that you that would uh, affect? Uh, I don't know if you ever smoked before you wrestled or anything, but is that something that would affect uh, your performance uh, in a negative way if if you were uh, high for a wrestling match? Uh yes, definitely. And I did more than once. I'm in a car full of guys, and they light up a joint, and pass it around. And one night, me and Pez Watley, I was driving, I was wrestling him that night, going to. No, uh, Poplar Bluffs, Missouri. That's where we were headed. And he had a joint with him, wanted to smoke it. I said, Harley Race. He told me, wait till after the matches. He said, oh, it won't hurt. So I smoked the joint with him. And he said, I want you to play the race card on me tonight. I said, what do you mean? He said, you know, call me call me names and tell me to shine your shoes. And I said, okay, I, said, I, can, I can do that. I said, you sure you want to do it? Because I just heard Dick Murdoch cut loose on Bobo Brazil and a thing like that. So I took Dick's lines, basically, hollered him a Pez, and uh, it was a tag match, and I was on the outside, so I stuck my head over the rope because he was going to come and you know, hit me then. So I was going to let him you know, come punch me. I was going to take a bump off the apron, but he hit me so hard he knocked me out and broke my nose. And I woke up, I didn't know where I was, and I'm laying on the floor, and people stand over and he's spitting on me, and I realized where I was and what was going on. So I got back in the ring, and I said, oh, I'm sorry. I said, oh, so you did it on purpose. He said, no, oh, no, it wasn't. I think it was an accident. Mm -hmm. So I never held it against him. Yeah. But, yeah, I don't recommend. I know a lot of guys do smoke, still do, before matches, but... uh if you know if they can work that way, great. But I hate to put my safety in their hands and some of the moves they're using today. Did, if they're stoned. Did uh, Pest, Pistol Pez? Uh, I always heard that he knew a lot of uh, uh, like shoot holds uh, to, to stretch people, like sugar holds and whatnot. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, he did. Did he ever teach you any or use any on you? Uh no. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, he never used any on me, no. Yeah. Uh, while we're talking about drugs, is there any uh, drugs that would enhance, like, uh, promos? Well, steroids would. Actually, pot could enhance promos, too. I mean, I've pract been practicing doing promos since I was 10 years old. I'd stand out in my backyard screaming like the crusher. Neighbors look out the window and think I went nuts. <laughs> I did that every day for years, and uh, I think the first good promo we, did, we had when we went to work for Saul Wein Weingroff, uh I was definitely stoned when I got there. We both were, and uh, but we cut a hell of a promo, and uh, they kept showing it on TV. I was in a liquor store with a couple of girls, and I came on TV, and I said, look. Look, I made the clerk stand there and watch it with me. I said, see that? <laughs> and uh, I was stoned then, so, yeah, the promos didn't didn't affect it at all. Probably enhanced it. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, did you ever do any uh, any coke? Because it does seem like in the '80s a lot of uh, a lot of the, the great promos were guys that were uh, uh, maybe coked up a little bit. Well, Lars Anderson tried to pay pay me and Tully Blanchard off in coke, <laughs> and I wouldn't take it because I knew he he said here have the line. I knew he was going to deduct it from my pay. I said no, uh, and uh, I mean I've done it, but it was never. Actually, steroids made me feel like Coke is supposed to make you feel. Coke never really did anything for me. So I, I never used it. But the steroids would make me feel like other people tell me Coke made them feel. So that's, well. mm-hmm. Instead of mailing you it out, it made you uh, excited, I guess. That's unusual. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know. I, I noticed on Facebook that your uh, your display picture is Hunter S. Thompson. Is that uh, like a hero of yours, or someone that you uh, enjoy uh, their work? Oh uh, yeah, he's my favorite author, and my favorite movie is Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Mm-hmm. And uh, of course, he wrote that book, and and I've I've, I've liked Hunter Thompson yes for gosh for thirty forty years probably. You're very eclectic. I think I have every book he ever wrote. Uh-huh. What is it about uh, Hunter S. Thompson that uh, that sticks with you? Just his style of writing. It's different than anybody else. And uh, I had some stuff in the book that I kind of tried to copy his, uh, not his style, but his, I don't know what you want to call it, his attitude. And uh, some of it got cut out, but most of it's still in there. Yeah. And uh, I don't know. He just he to me he was a superior writer. Mm-hmm. And then uh, he went and killed himself. He said, "Well, this is it." He said, "I've had enough." And he said, "Don't feel bad." And he committed suicide. But I still have all these books here, and I still read them. Mm-hmm. Uh, Terry Gilliam uh, directed the movie for people who don't know, but yeah, it's a, it's a it is a great film. Uh, how does it how does it compare? I've never actually read the book. How does the movie compare to the book? Does it really does it capture like uh, the vibe of the mo- of the book? Uh, I think it pretty much does. It, yeah, it pretty much does, and it actually one of the first movies that actually captured what dropping acid is really like when you see the rug in the hotel and stuff uh-huh. moving, and it did a good job of that. I thought. Mm-hmm. Uh, when, when's the last time? Like, uh, how how long in, uh, period in your life uh, were you uh, dropping acid? Oh, I guess I started in. 66, and probably through 76. It was about 10 years. What led you to uh, to quit? Uh, it just wasn't any good anymore. They took away some chemical that was in it that, that I think they made it illegal or something. Mm-hmm. And it just wasn't the same. It wasn't enjoyable anymore, so I just quit doing it. Mean, the last time I took it, I went to Disneyland. <laughs> how does that, that was years ago. How does that affect the rides? Like going on uh, <laughs> Space Mountain and uh, on acid. Yeah, that was the first ride we went on, yep. <laughs> <laughs> and we mean the actual ride, not Ric Flair's Space Mountain. By the way, so. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so, uh, again, everyone get the book, uh, The Mat, The Mob, and The Music. It's uh, Crowbar Press. Um I'm really looking forward to uh, reading this now. I read the excerpts on uh, on Crowbar Press, and uh, talking uh-huh. to you, I definitely want to uh, read the book because you're a great storyteller, and uh, you're around. It's really cool because you've been around for decades. You've been around all different people and different uh, different worlds there, and I think you've done a good job tonight in, uh, in uh, getting people to uh, to want to read the book. Well, thank you. I appreciate it, and I hope they do. I hope they check it out. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, after I read it, it would be cool to actually have you back on, and uh, I could ask you some more questions about some stuff specifically in the book, if you'd be cool. Sure, that'd be great. Yeah. And I want to thank you for coming on tonight. It's been an hour and a half, and it just flew by. Yeah, it did. It was fast. Yeah. 
Which, which well, is, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, really, it's been a great time talking to you. And for people listening, um, if they'd want to follow you on Facebook, or I don't know if you're on Twitter, uh, how can they find you? Uh, they can find me just Tom Hankins on Facebook. And there's a little drawing of Hunter Thompson there with my name. Mm-hmm. And if they're a member, and, uh, if they're a member of the In Your Head uh, group, you, you, you're uh, a member there, so they can uh, find you right in there. Uh, my number? No, I said, and you're a member of of our oh. Facebook group. So, if for the people, listeners there that are on Facebook in our uh, in your head wrestling group, they can yeah. find you posting right in there. Actually, I've got about twelve pages on Facebook devoted to wrestling, but trying to cut them down is too much work every day. Trying to add new content to them all. Mm-hmm. Well, very cool. Well, I do appreciate coming on. It really was uh, it was it was great talking to you. Thank you. Great talking to you, too. All right. We'll uh, be right back. This is Dave Meltzer of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter, and you're listening to InYourHeadOnline.com.